Happy New Year. Happy Chinese New Year. That's a, that's a little private joke for Professor Russell, of course, since he knows that the Mamagonians originally uh, are said to have uh, come from China. A couple of announcements. On February 24th, in a couple of weeks, we will have another event here at Nasser with Professor George Bernuccian from Iona College in New York. Professor Bernuccian, who, who is familiar certainly to many of you, will be speaking on the Book of History of Arakel of Tabriz, a vital source on 17th century Armenia and more. Uh, Professor Bernuccian has translated uh, and annotated this, this crucial source uh, uh, of Armenian history, and he will be here speaking about this. And on March 3rd, uh, I'm, I'm almost sure anyway, uh, this is going to happen, but the announcement will be coming out anyway. Uh, we're, we're working on having Professor Martin Bechtold and Alan Sayeg from uh, Harvard's Graduate School of Design, uh, along with Professor Russell, who is here tonight from Harvard, uh, who will be presenting, uh, giving a presentation relating to the project that uh, took place last year at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. It's called uh, Traces, a Museum Without Artifacts, and it was tested in the context of a new genocide museum for Yerevan. It was a class project, essentially, and uh, with the participation of Professor Russell and the two professors who uh, oversaw this, uh, students created designs or theoretical models for this uh, genocide museum in Yerevan, a museum without artifacts, and we will uh, have them here to discuss this, and details, as I, as I say, are for, will be forthcoming. So, very pleased to have our speaker with us tonight, Professor Tanner Akjam, uh, about whom I think you probably heard. Professor Akjam was born in Ardahan province, Turkey, in 1953. He's the author of uh, a number of scholarly works of history and sociology, including the books in English, from Empire to Republic, Turkish Nationalism, and the Armenian Genocide, and A Shameful Act, the Armenian Genocide, and Turkish Responsibility, as well as numerous articles in Turkish, German, and English. His next book, uh, uh, from which tonight's lecture in part derives, uh, will be forthcoming in English uh, in the coming year, and I'm sure he will give us a little bit more information about that. Uh, we've had the pleasure, Nasser has had the pleasure of, of co-sponsoring a couple of uh, Professor Akjam's talks at Harvard with the Mashtots Chair and with other groups, the Zorian Institute, in previous years. And we've worked with him on, uh, for example, the uh, workshop last spring held at Clark University on the state of the art of Armenian genocide research. But it's the first time we've had the pleasure of welcoming, welcoming him here to the Nasser Center to speak. So. We welcome him here to the Nasser Center to speak. Tanner, please. Thank you very much, Mark. And how does it work? Ah. Just simple arrow. OK, good. Let's do that. OK. So good evening. <laughs> of course. Sorry about that. No, it's OK. Nothing personal. <laughs> So as Mark said, I mean, it's a pleasure for me to be here, really. It's great that you could make it by this weather. Uh, it took me more than two hours to come here from Worcester. Uh, uh. So the topic of this evening is the assimilation. Uh, and this is a chapter in my forthcoming book. This is a project that I'm still uh, working on it. And the main argument is that Assimilation was really indeed a very important component, a structural element of Armenian genocide. And I will try to show this based on uh, Ottoman documents especially. But uh, before doing it, I would like to talk a little bit on the theoretical contextualization of the problem. 
So this means on the relation of assimilation and genocide. And the second, I will talk a little bit about the sources that I used in this research. This is basically talking on some Ottoman documents. And then uh, the third pa part is basically the information on the assimilation itself. And on the question of assimilation, we have to make a distinction between uh, religion, religious policy, this is the conversion to Islam, this is a policy for itself, and the second part is the special policy of the Ottoman government towards Armenian children. Uh, I think we have to make this distinction, and uh, I will try to show the systematic behind these government policies. First point, the assimilation and the genocide. So it is well known, I put here the uh, 1948 uh, convention, and uh, this is the famous uh, 1948 uh, convention, and uh, genocide here uh, is described basically these five points, and as you see, uh, among these, uh, there is number E, forcibly transferring children of the group another group. This is uh, considered also as a sign of the cultural aspect of the genocide. This uh, actually, there was another resolution or another genocide uh, convention, and this was the first proposition that was prepared by Lemkin and this was called Secretariat Draft, and it was accepted and for the United Nations Secretariat and May 1943. So important part here is, in that 1947, one year before, in that first draft, there was a crime described as crime cultural genocide. So uh, cultural destroying the specific characteristic of the group in, a, in the culture, and it was made a list again, five, six different points, and they totally took out in 1948 definition. So the cultural crime, was it was really defined as a form of crime, but 1948 in the convention, it was totally taken out, only one point that I mentioned before, this forcibly transferring children of the group to another group was taken from this entire draft. And in uh, the discussion around, it is not our, not my topic today, but uh, the important aspect is in his autobiography, Totally Unofficial Man, this is the title of Lemkin's autobiography, Lemkin regrets that he could not persuade the relevant United Nations Committee meeting to include an article in the final convention called on cultural genocide. And he continues, I defended it successfully throughout two drafts. It means the destruction of the cultural pattern of a group, such as the language, the tradition, the monuments, archives, libraries, churches, in brief, the shrines of the soul of a nation. But there was not enough support for this idea in the committee, so with a heavy heart, I decided not to press for it. So, according to Lemkin, he had to drop the, an idea with his words was very dear to him. But I think the difference was not only limited to the cultural aspect of genocide. This 1948 United Nations definition caused some other serious problems in the social science. One important of these dis differences in Lemkin's approach, I have to note it. Lemkin understood in his early writings genocide not as a single act. This is a very crucial point in Lemkin's understanding. Actually, for Lemkin, genocide was a series of connected acts, a process that unfolds over a certain period of time. 
Again, from Lemkin, I'm quoting, generally speaking, he says, in access rule in occupied Europe, the work that introduced the concept genocide does not necessarily mean the immediate destruction of a nation. And he consider, continues, he says, genocide does not, again, does not necessarily mean the immediate destruction of a nation. In contrast, the Genocide Convention of 1948 enshrined a narrower concept of genocide as a unitary event or act that resulted in the immediate destruction of a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. So, after the broader concept of genocide as a prolonged process slipped into oblivion, all subsequent debates, today related it's to the Armenian genocide also, revolved around whether a given specific episode of mass violence conform to the United Nations definition of genocide and therefore could be qualified as such. This was an unfortunate and probably unavoidable consequence of the adoption of genocide as a concept of criminal law. So we took over a term in the criminal law in social science and approached with this definition to the social event. And as a result of it, we discussed only separate one or other single event and whether or not this event fits the definition or not. This was the basic scholarship on the uh, genocide. Even though there is a window in the convention to interpret a little bit differently, another consequence of legal definition was the conceptualization of genocide solely as an act of physical destruction. For the inventor of the term, however, the physical destruction was only one aspect of the genocidal process, and Lemkin understood the genocide as a social reality constructs as much as it destroys. Again, with Lemkin's word, quote, he says, genocide has two faces. One, destruction of the national pattern of the oppressed group. Second, the other, the imposition of the national pattern of the oppressors. So, while the second phase, the imposition of the national pattern of the oppressors can take many different forms and definitely, without doubt, assimilation is among the most effective ways to achieve this result. And scholarly debates on genocide has been neglected the constructive phase of genocide for too long. So, according to my understanding, after intensive reading of Lemkin, genocide definition 1948 created three major problems in our social science. Number one, as I said, genocide was regarded as a single event and the event in question, which was generally physical annihilation, was examined from the perspective of whether or not it confirmed the 1948 convention. Number two, two second one, those social scientists who did not agree with the United Nations definition, whether justified or not, they began proposing their own definitions. Nearly, without exaggeration, every genocide scholar had her or his own definition, and therefore, most debates were focused on classification and labeling on a certain term. This is the second serious problem in social science. I will give some examples of how. Number three, the Holocaust occupied the central place in these debates as a sine qua non. Similarity to Holocaust became the yardstick against which an event might or might not measure up as a genocide. Every researcher, including the Armenian genocide, of the mass violence, other than the Holocaust, spent enormous 
amount of energy trying to prove that the event they were studying shared similarities with the Holocaust, so as to strengthen the case of genocide. So in Armenian genocide research also, almost all genocide scholars pushed the Armenian case as close as Holocaust, so that to prove that, you see, it is like Holocaust, so it must be a genocide. This is another important, very serious theoretical academic problem. So these three main points, I consider these the summary of the first stage of genocide historiography. Instead of developing models and trying to explain a dynamic process, genocide scholars were working with a static concept that was delimited by definition as a single act. I call this first phase of uh, scholarship as the phase of definitionalism. So, and this was equal like a methodological suicide for social science, actually. Because genocide scholars have constructed their individual definitions of genocide, like this Greek, Greek mythology of the Procrustean bat, and every, they analyze the social events according to their definition by choice, according to their bat, and some points if it was not fitting to that path, they stretch too much. If it was shortened, they cut uh, a little bit. And in general, cutting and passing the narrative too much to match their path. To understand a dynamic historical process over a period of time was less important than whether or not a given sequence of the events met the definition of the concept that we are proposing. So this is, I think, the, it was not different in Armenian genocide research also, and Armenian genocide studies have also suffered from the general weakness of emerging field and have had a, to contend with similar issues. I think especially given the Turkish Republic's uh, denial regarding the mass annihilation, the question of whether or not the 1948 definition of genocide or other definitions could appropriately be applied to the event of 1915 became the lodestone for all debate. The fear that the events 1915 would not be considered genocide if they did not resemble Holocaust obstructed serious analysis along the lines of dynamic process, redirecting it towards providing, proving just how similar the Armenian genocide was to the Holocaust. So, meanwhile, a concerted effort was made by us, let me put in general way, to ignore all the differences. Everything's okay? Don't do that again. Yeah. <laughs> I will take back all my arguments here. This is technology does not agree with me. So then uh, it was a similar concordant effort uh, to ignore all differences that naturally would arise between two different, different events of mass violence. So I assume that this, uh, hopefully and fortunately, we can say that this state of the affairs is beginning to change. And I understand my uh, forthcoming book also a contribution to that direction and the new genocide scholarship are not so we are not too much stick on the 1948 definition we use the term genocide like the term art everybody use the term art but everybody understands something different so this is approximately where the genocide scholarship is and instead of uh, debating and discussing on one sin single term, we try to understand and identify the states of mind, the institutional structures, and the characters of the mass violences, and how these structures and state of mind functions, and where these breaks and continuities in a long process. So to understand a dynamic process are more important for us in order to debate whether one event fits this definition or not. So 
process, the concept of process has been replaced in the place of definition. This is how we approach generally. So this is the, my approach in my forthcoming book. And so these are all genocides definition. And let's come to the second part. Uh, second reason why assimilation was ignored in Armenian genocide research, uh, I will make it this way, it's the English translation of these Ottoman documents, how it's structured, you can see. It is the second reason is the, uh, the sources that was available for the scholars. So even though we had a lot of information in consular reports or in survivor accounts, on both aspects of the assimilation, namely religious conversion and distribution of Armenian children in Muslim households, there were no truly systematic study has been made on this issue. This has been directly related to the character of the available sources. Until recently, the main source for this topic were either German or American consular reports or survivor accounts. And their information leaves the impression of there being cows a food in the true sense of the word instead of a systematic policy in this area. One reason of the creation of this kind of confusion was the lack of knowledge of what the different decisions were that the Ottoman administrator took during this process. The consuls and the missionaries were like many others, like the survivors also, without knowledge of these central decisions and their reports, these uh, consular reports, did not consist of precise records with respect to chronology which could have made the administrative changes evident. Instead, they were mostly in form of observations covering a long period of time and with some generalization. This 